Hello there class, um, welcome back. As you can probably see, we have a new story today. Um, it's by David Williams. It's called The Billionaire Boy. Uh, I don't know if you know, but David Williams is actually producing some online uh, stories um, for you to listen to. So if you give that a search, you might be able to hear the author himself reading one of these stories to you. And I'm going to have a go at this one today. It's called The Billionaire Boy. Um, it's about a young chap called Joe Spud. Meet Joe Spud, the richest 12-year-old in the world. Joe has everything he could ever want. His own Formula One racing car, a thousand pairs of trainers, even an orangutan for a butler. Yes, Joe has everything he wants. There's just one thing he really needs. A friend. Let's open it up to him. I like this page, by the way. It's Joe there, surrounded by lots and lots of money. Okay, chapter one, meet Joe Spud. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to have a million pounds? Or a billion? How about a million? Or even a gazillion? Meet Joe Spud. Joe didn't have to imagine what it would be like to have loads and loads and loads of money. He was only 12, but he was ridiculously, preposterously rich. Joe had everything he could ever want. 100-inch plasma widescreen, flat screen, high-definition TV in every room in the house. 500 pairs of Nike trainers. A Grand Prix racetrack in the back garden. A robot dog from Japan. A golf buggy with a number plate, Spud 2, to drive around the grounds of his house. A water slide, which went from his bedroom into an indoor Olympic-sized swimming pool. Every computer game in the world. 3D IMAX cinema in the basement. A crocodile. 24-hour personal masseuse. Underground 10-lane bowling alley. Snooker table. Popcorn dispenser. Skateboard park. Another crocodile. A £100,000 a week pocket money. A roller coaster in the back garden. A professional recording studio in the attic. Personalised football coaching from the England team. A real-life shark in a tank. In short, Joe was one horribly spoilt kid. He went to a ridiculously posh school. He flew on private planes whenever he went on holiday. Once, he even had Disney World closed for the day, just so he wouldn't have to queue for any rides. Here's Joe, speeding around his own private racetrack in his Formula One racing car. Some very rich children have miniature versions of cars specially built for them. Joe wasn't one of those children. Joe needed his Formula One car made bigger. He was quite fat, you see. Well, you would be, wouldn't you, if you could buy all the chocolate in the world? You will have noticed that Joe is on his own in that picture. To tell the truth, speeding around a racetrack isn't that much fun when you're on your own, even if you do have a squillion pounds. You really need someone to race against. The problem was... Joe didn't have any friends. Not one. Friends. Uh -uh. Now, driving a Formula One car and unwrapping a king-sized Mars bar are two things you shouldn't try and do at the same time. But it had been a few moments since Joe had last eaten and he was hungry. As he entered the chicane, he tore open the wrapper with his teeth and took a bite of the delicious chocolate-coated nougat and caramel. Unfortunately, Joe only had one hand on the steering wheel and as the wheels of the car hit the verge... He lost control. The multi-million pound Formula One car careered off the track, span around and hit a tree. Screech! The tree was unharmed, but the car was a write-off. Joe squeezed himself out of the cockpit. Luckily, Joe wasn't hurt, but he was a little dazed when he tottered back to the house. Dad, I crashed the car, said Joe as he entered the palatial living room. Mr Spud was short and fat, just like his son. Hairier in a lot of places too, apart from his head, which was bald and shiny. Joe's dad was sitting on a hundred-seater crocodile-skin sofa and didn't look up from reading the day's copy of The Sun. Don't worry, Joe, he said. I'll buy you another one. Joe slumped down on the sofa next to his dad. Oh, happy birthday, by the way, Joe, Mr Spud handed an envelope to his son without taking his eyes off the girl on page three. Joe opened the envelope eagerly. How much money was going to receive this year? The card, which read, Happy 12th birthday, son, was quickly discarded 
in favour of the cheque inside. Joe could barely disguise his disappointment. One million pounds? He scoffed. Is that all? What's the matter, son? Mr Spud put down his newspaper for a moment. You gave me a million last year, whined Joe, when I turned eleven. Surely I should get more now I'm twelve. Mr Spud reached into the pocket of his shiny grey designer suit and pulled out his cheque. His suit was horrible and horribly expensive. I'm so sorry, son, he said. Let's make it two million. Now, it's important you realise that Mr Spud had not always been rich. Not so long ago, the Spud family had lived in a very humble life. From the age of 16, Mr Spud worked in a vast loo roll factory on the outskirts of town. Mr Spud's job at the factory was so boring. He had to roll the paper around the cardboard inner tube. Roll after roll, day after day, year after year, decade after decade. This he did over and over again until nearly all his hope had gone. He would stand all day by the conveyor belt with hundreds of other bored workers repeating the same mind-numbing task. Every time the paper roll was rolled onto the one cardboard tube, the whole thing started again. And every loo roll was the same. Because the family was so poor, Mr Spud used to make birthday and Christmas presents for his son from the loo roll in the tubes. Mr Spud never had enough money to buy Joe all the latest toys but would make him something like a loo roll racing car or a loo roll fort complete with dozens of loo roll soldiers. Most of them got broken and ended up in the bin. Joe did manage to save a sad looking little loo roll space rocket, though he wasn't sure why. The only good thing about working in a factory was that Mr Spud had lots of time to daydream. One day he had a daydream that was to revolutionise bottom wiping forever. Why not invent a loo roll that is moist on one side and dry on the other? he thought, as he rolled paper around his thousandth, thousandth roll of the day. Mr Spud kept his idea top secret and toiled for hours, locked in the bathroom with their little council flat, getting his new double-sided loo roll exactly right. When Mr Spud finally launched Bumfresh, it was an instant phenomenon. Mr Spud sold billion rolls around the world every day, and every time a loo roll was sold, he made 10p. It all added up to an awful lot of money as this simple maths equation shows. 10p times 1 billion rolls times 365 days a year equals a lot of wonga. Joe Spud was only eight time, was, Joe Spud was only eight at the time Bumfresh was launched and his life was turned upside down in a heartbeat. First, Joe's mum and dad split up. It turned out that for many years, Joe's mum, Carol, had been having a torrid affair with Joe's Cub Scout leader, Alan. She took a 10 billion pound divorce settlement Alan swapped his canoe for a gigantic yacht. Last anyone had heard, Carolyn and Alan were sailing off the coast of Dubai, pouring vintage champagne on their crunchy nut cornflakes every morning. Joe's dad seemed to get over the split quite quickly and began going on dates with an endless parade of page three girls. Soon father and son moved out of their pokey council flat and into an enormous stately home. Mr Spud named it Bumfresh Towers. The house was so large it was visible from outer space. It took five minutes just to motor up the drive. Hundreds of newly planted, hopeful little trees lined the mile-long gravel track. The house had seven kitchens, 12 sitting rooms, 48 bedrooms and 89 bathrooms. Even the bathrooms had ensuite bathrooms, and some of those ensuite bathrooms had on ensuite bathrooms. Despite living there for a few years, Joe had probably only ever explored around a quarter of the main house. In the endless grounds were tennis courts, a boating lake, a helipad and even a hundred metre ski slope complete with mountains of fake snow. All the taps, door handles and even toilet seats were solid gold. The carpets were made from mink fur. He and his dad drank orange squash from priceless antique medieval goblets and for a while they had a butler called Otis who was also an orangutan but he had to be given the sack. Can I have a proper present as well dad? said Joe as he put the cheque in his trouser pocket. I mean I've got loads of money already. Tell me what you want, son, and I'll get you one of my assistants to buy it, said Mr Spud. Some solid gold sunglasses. I've got a pair. You can't see out of them, but they are very expensive. Joe yawned. Your own speedboat, ventured Mr Spud. Joe rolled his eyes. I've got two of those, remember? Sorry, son. How about a quarter of a million pounds worth of W. H. Smith vouchers? Boring, boring, boring. Joe stamped his feet in frustration. Here was a boy with high-class problems. Mr Spud looked forlorn. He wasn't sure there was anything left in the world that he could buy his only child. 
Then what, son? Joe suddenly had a thought. He pictured himself going round the racetrack all on his own, racing against himself. Well, there is something I really want, he said tentatively. Name it, son, said Mr Spud. A friend.